Okay, um, welcome everyone to um, the NRC FAHE webinar today, or, or the National Research Collaborative for Foster Alumni in Higher Education, our webinar series. My name is Amy Salazar, I'm on the executive leadership team. Um, if any of you are not yet on our email list and you'd like to be, please go to our website, which is here on the screen. It's www.nrc-fahe.org. And if you scroll down to the bottom of that screen, you can see the place to um, subscribe to our listserv. Um, so before we get started uh, with our webinar today, I just want to um, give some information on our November webinar. Um, so the November webinar will be held on Thursday, November 12th from 11 to noon Pacific time, 2 to 3 Eastern. Um, and the presenters that day um, will be Dr. Rachel Kirk, Tyrese Tate, and David Halpern from Texas A&M University. Um, and in their presentation, which will be entitled Supervised Independent Living Finds a New Home, uh, Texas A&M University System, they'll discuss Texas A&M's partnership with the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services to provide food, shelter, and an education to Texas's foster alumni at no cost to the students. So please feel free to join us for that. The registration link is in the listserv email on the NRC FAHE website, or if you have any trouble, um, just get, uh, email me directly. Um, so uh, today's webinar, we will have, for today's webinar, um, we'll have Svetlana Spiel. Uh, she's an associate, prof oh, I hope I said your last name right, um, Svetlana. Yes, you, you did. Okay, great. <laughs> so Svetlana is an associate professor at the Department of Social Work and Child Advocacy at Montclair State University. Um, and her research focuses on the functioning of adolescents and young adults emancipating from the foster care system. And she's particularly interested in early pregnancy and parenting among current and former foster youth and the effects of parenthood on youth socioeconomic outcomes. So before I hand it over to Svetlana for her presentation today, I just wanna say that she's gonna present for about 40, 45 minutes and then we'll open it up for Q&A time. But please feel free to go ahead and type your questions into the chat box as we go. And at the end, I'll read those out to Svetlana. Um, so I think that's everything. Okay, uh, Svetlana, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Hey, Sammy, let me just share my screen here real quick. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so hi, everybody. Thank you for joining this webinar. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. As Amy said, I, my name is Svetlana. I am an associate professor at Montclair State University. Been there about eight years at this point. And my research has been on youth who age out of the foster care system. And I would say about the last five years, I focused primarily unexpectant and parenting youth in foster care. I've listed some projects, uh, my current projects that are relevant to this specific group. So I'm, I'm doing an evaluation of um, a program that is at my university called Red Hawk Fellows Program, which is a campus-based support program for independent students and foster youth. And I'm also going to start a project on the experiences of parenting youth during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this particular project is this third bullet there, um, and that is um, disparities in higher education access among foster youth who have children. And in general, I work with large administrative data sets, um, NITED, AFCARS, INC, and some others. Um, so this particular project includes some findings from that third bullet point there. Um, so um, I know Amy said that uh, we have, we're gonna keep questions to the end, but I did wanna ask you a kickoff question, uh, so to speak. Um, what do you think, oh, and maybe you could just type some um, answers in the chat function. Um, but I was just curious, what do you think are some of the barriers for pursuing higher education among young mothers with foster care backgrounds? What are some of the things that might prevent or make it difficult for them to do that? And I'm just gonna give you maybe a minute or two to type something. And then Amy, if you could read me uh, the answers because I can't see them, that would be wonderful. Sure, so we have uh, inadequate access to child care, another child care, cost of child care. <laughs> yeah, everybody's kind of saying uh, child care at this, uh, at this mm -hmm. point. Um, and knowing what's available in terms of financial support for education. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Absolutely. So work-life balance. Work-life balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so that's exactly right. There are many barriers uh, that affect access to higher education among this population. And I'll talk about some of that uh, at the end once I go over my findings. Um, I want to say that uh, because this, uh, my understanding from Amy was uh, this group is a mix of researchers and practitioners. I've tried to make this presentation as practitioner friendly as possible. So some of the more uh, kind of technical stats is not here, but if anybody's interested in the specific odds ratios and the significance levels and all of that, I am, please email me. I'm happy to talk about this project. This is hopefully going to be uh, a published article soon. Um, and I'm happy to provide any additional information, but I left it out of this presentation uh, just uh, so that it's accessible uh, and interesting for both the research folks among us and for practitioners. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, just kind of a little bit of background about early childhood among youth in foster care. Um, and there's been more studies recently on this specific population. Um, and we know from several studies that have been done in the past five, six, seven years, that girls who are currently or formerly in care have higher rates of early childbirth. And that applies both to the period of adolescence and also to this period of transition to adulthood. Um, so if I take all of the findings on this, uh, it's probably safe to say that about 20% of girls across various samples of foster youth uh, give birth by age 19. And by age 21, that number rises to as high as 40% and even higher in some samples. Um, and even though research kind of on the experiences of, of young mothers in care increased, there's some gaps in, in this, in this uh, particular uh, body of literature, especially as it pertains to access to higher education. But what does research say in general? Um, we have some good qualitative studies on um, how foster youth experience motherhood. And some research shows that they actually view motherhood uh, in a positive light, right? They say motherhood brings a renewed sense of purpose, motivation. It makes me want to do better. It makes me want to discontinue some of my risky behaviors and give a better life to my kids um, and myself. But a lot of the times what happens is that if you look at the outcomes of young mothers as compared to other foster youth who are not mothers, um, the few studies that have done that find some discrepancies in their outcomes and especially difficulties with education, employment, housing, and financial self-sufficiency, right? So a lot of motivations, uh, motivation among these mothers to succeed and do well, but some difficulties uh, balancing this new motherhood and aging out of foster care. Um, in terms of higher education, so as you all know, probably foster youth are one of the most underrepresented groups in higher ed. Um, and, and again, if we compile the stats across various studies, we'll see that about 30% enroll in higher education uh, across various programs, but less than 10% actually complete a four-year degree. So very much underrepresented. And you know, as I was preparing for this presentation and for this project in general, um, I tried very hard to find any data on post-secondary educational attainment among young mothers specifically that age out of care. And I wasn't able to find anything and I consulted with some colleagues and then they've confirmed that they have not seen anything specific to this group. So essentially, we don't really know, right, what uh, the, the post-secondary educational attainment for these girls looks like. Now, what do we know? There are some studies, uh, a few, not a lot, but some that find that looked at uh, having a high school diploma or GED and found some discrepancies there, right? So young mothers were less likely to have a high school diploma or GED compared to foster youth who are not moms, right? Um, and also, if you look at studies at the general population, we know that young mothers, teen moms, and young moms in general are less likely to pursue higher education 
compared to uh, women that delay childbirth. Um, so from all of that, you know, you, uh, I've, I've sort of said, well, there, there is no data on foster youth. Clearly, there is reason to suspect that there might be discrepancies in access to higher education. So let's look at that, right? So, so what are the goals of this study? Um, I wanted to look at um, kind of what is the post-secondary educational attainment among young mothers um, in care or aging out of care. So some are still in care and some are, have exited already. Um, and I'm looking at age 21, okay? And then um, I wanted to also look at the risk protective and child welfare factors that are associated with post-secondary educational attainment among these young mothers, okay? So those were kind of the goals of the study. Um, what are the sources that I've used? So this project includes a linked data set uh, that includes two sources. First is the National Youth in Transition Database, NITED. Um, so those of you who are not familiar with NITED, um, it's a data, it's a federally mandated um, data collection, right? Uh, that requires states to collect information on all youth who are in care at age 17 at specific years. So NITED cohorts begin every three years. The first was in 2011. And the second, which is what I'm using here in this presentation is in 2014. And then once a youth is age 17 in uh, that fiscal year, 2014, they're also followed at ages 19 and 21 if they participated at the age 17 data collection. And then in addition to that, um, I use the AFCRS data, which again, most of you probably are familiar with, and that is a federally mandated, again, data collection system on all kids who are in foster care in the United States. And that has information on things like placement type and placement stability um, and other important child welfare characteristics. So NITED has information on youth outcomes and AFCARS have has information on their child welfare experiences. And you can link those two data sets using a unique child identifier. Um, so the sample for this specific study, and I'll talk about um, I'll talk about limitations at the end of this presentation. I'm sure again those those of, of us who are researchers are familiar with NITED and know that the data has some limitations. So I will discuss all of that at the end. But who, who are the girls that I've included in this sample? I essentially included girls who participated in all three waves of NITED data collection, right? So those who participated at age 17 at baseline and also participated at age 19 and 21, okay? And even though those were the girls that are, in, so this is about, as you can see, 3,669 girls in total, okay? Um, and they come from all states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. But again, even though it's a national sample, it's not a nationally representative sample. And that's important to remember because this is a subset, right? And I'll talk about how this specific population is actually, um, it's not representative of, of all youth in foster care necessarily because uh, of various uh, issues related to who participates and how much dropout we see across waves, okay? Nevertheless, it's a large sample um, and you could see that about 40% were non-Hispanic whites, 20% uh, black, but, oh, I'm sorry, 28% black, 22% Hispanic, and then we have some multiracial and Native American um, and Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander youth as well. And just to kind of reiterate the point that this is a sub subset of the United um, population, uh, about 60% were no longer in care at age 19, which is actually higher than uh, those youth, uh, than kind of the overall United population who may have not participated in all three waves of of the data collection, right? Who may have dropped out at some point. Um, so that's important to remember and I'll reiterate that at the end because I think that has some impact on what we see here. Um, so some of the important variables that I wanted to define. Um, so NITED asks about whether 
a youth has given birth or fathered a child that was born. Um, and um, they ask that at every wave, right? At the baseline, at age 17, they ask about any birth, right? So at any point, have you given birth? At age 19 and 21 data collection, they ask about the previous two years, right? So essentially a youth who said at age 19, yes, I've given birth, the, the birth has occurred between ages 17 and 19, right? And if at age 21, they said, yes, I've given birth, that birth refers to ages 19 to 21, okay? Um, and the way that I've done this analysis, um, I, I wanted to look at some bivariate differences between girls who had any kids and those who had no kids at all, right? Regardless of the timing of birth. And then in multivariate analysis, I only included mothers and um, the timing of birth is looked at more closely because I wanna see if uh, when they give, gave birth, if that matters for their um, post-secondary educational attainment at age 21. Now, in terms of how I defined post-secondary educational attainment, so you actually have to use two variables to kind of determine whether or not a youth um, has any kind of post-secondary education involvement, right? You, so there is a variable that asks about the highest educational certificate. Um, so you could see if the youth has a credential, right? And that could be a vocational certificate, vocational license, associate's degree, bachelor's degree, or higher degree, okay? But you can also look at whether or not a youth potentially only has a high school diploma or GED, but currently they're enrolled in school, right? Um, and the way that the variables are defined, if they have a high school diploma in GED or GED, and they also say that they're currently enrolled in school, you could uh, determine that they're enrolled in some kind of post-secondary setting, okay? Um, and then you could also look at those who have a high school diploma, right, and no post-secondary uh, enrollment or credential, and those who have no high school diploma at all, right? And I also want to mention that for some analysis, I've tried as much as possible to keep these four categories separate, right? So talk about youth who have a credential, a post-secondary credential, post-secondary enrollment but not credential, only high school diploma GED or nothing, right? But sometimes I, in some analysis, I combined categories one and two, and talked about post-secondary credential or enrollment, right? Um, because of low, low ends, uh, essentially, uh, especially in that first category. So I've tried to include both, so you have the fullest picture uh, about what these girls um, have and do not have. Um, in terms of risk factors, um, I've looked at risk and protective factors at age 19. Right, and I've looked specifically at homelessness, substance abuse referrals, incarceration, and diagnosed disability, which by the way, uh, an asterisk there, that's the only variable that actually was examined. It, it was taken from AFCAR, so it looks at age 17, but it doesn't really matter because it, it's a diagnosed disability that will likely uh, would have applied at age 19 as well. Um, and then protective factors, I looked at educational financial assistance, uh, a youth, uh, whether or not a youth had a full-time or part-time employment at age 19, and whether or not they had a supportive adult at age 19. In terms of child welfare factors, I looked at placement type at age 17, placement stability that was also evaluated at age 17, and extended foster care status at age 19. So these were the variables that I have used. Um, so at first, I want to show you kind of the educational credentials for the entire sample, right? For the all 3,000 plus girls, regardless of childbirth, okay? Um, and as you can see here, when we look at highest educational attainment, right, um, then about 75% slightly over received a high school diploma or GED, and that's it. That's their highest attainment. Um, close to 8% received a vocational certificate, vocational license, or an associate's degree. And again, and I combined it because the numbers are very low um, and it really didn't make sense to look at it separately. 
uh, you will see that um, the rates of having a bachelor's degree or higher are very, very low. It's less than 1%, which is not surprising at all, because remember, these youth are only age 21, right? So even in the general youth population, you probably wouldn't see a lot of bachelor degree completion or definitely higher degree completion, right, by age 21. So that is uh, why those numbers are so low, but nevertheless, I wanted to put it out there. Um, and then less than 20%, so this is about 17%, had, didn't have any, right? So they did not have a high school diploma. Um, and I, by the way, I see things popping up in the chat. Um, Oh, it's about this being available later. Oh, okay, okay. Because yeah. I can't. Uh, if if there is something relevant, Amy, just let me know if something is clear or uh, or I need to repeat something. Okay. Um, yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. So so again, these are the educational credentials for the full sample, right? Um, I'm sorry, no, this is stuck. Okay. So now um, we're looking at higher education enrollment and credential, right? So again, kind of combining these two variables are, I discussed earlier, and again, that is for the full sample of girls. We'll get to uh, expectant and parenting youth specifically, and you will see that um, less than 10% had a credential, uh, about 25% had um, did not have a credential but were enrolled, about 50% had a high school diploma or GED, and as I've said before, less than 20%, about 17% did not have a high school diploma. Um, and if you combine credential and enrollment, right, so over one third either had a higher education credential already, and as I've said before, most of that was an associate's degree or vocational degrees, right? Um, or they were enrolled and then uh, the rest were not. So this is where we get to childbirth. Um, I just want to give a, an, an idea about birth rates. So almost 40% of girls in the sample had uh, reported at least one birth by age 21, right? So fairly high rates, quite consistent with prior research. Um, if we want to look at when kids, uh, when these youth were giving birth, right? So about 7% of the sample reported giving birth before age 17. About 14% reported giving birth between ages 17 and 19. And about 30% gave birth between ages 19 and 21. So again, consistent with prior research, the older they are, and as they enter this transition to adulthood period, the higher the rates of birth. Um, and so now I wanted to just show you the distribution of educational credential by childbirth, right? So we looked at that for the overall sample. This is breaking it down uh, by uh, having a child, at least one birth by age 17, which is this yes on the left. And for those girls who did not report any births before uh, by age 21. Okay, and as you can see, um, the rates of having a vocational or associate's degree are actually pretty comparable, right? Um, slightly less girls had a high school diploma in GED in the parenthood group, right? Um, and then more girls did, uh, who are parents didn't have uh, any credential. So these are again, highest credential, right? Now we're going to look at enrollment, right? Higher education enrollment or credential. Okay, so again, you will see here that they're having um, a credential, the rates for that are quite similar for those females who had kids and those who did not, right? And that uh, is a little bit less than 10%, it's about 8% actually. But the big discrepancy that you will see is in current enrollment in higher education settings at age 21. Right, so only about 14% of mothers were enrolled in higher education settings and as compared to more than 30% of females who did not have children, right? Um, so, so there is a big discrepancy there. Um, and this again is, is just kind of combining enrollment and, or 
credential, and, and this just reiterates those differences, right? Slightly over 20% of mothers were either enrolled in higher education at age 21 or had a credential compared to 40, almost 40% 40 of females who did not have children. So quite substantial discrepancies there, okay? Um, so what does that all mean up till now, right? Um, Essentially, as you could see, uh, childbirth is very common, right? Nearly 40% of females in this sample had given birth by age 21, and most of these births occurred between ages 19 and 21. And then, as I've said before, mothers and females who weren't mothers, and non-mothers is probably not the right term to use here, um, but bear with me, English is a second language. Um, so, uh, they obtained a post-secondary credential, right, at similar rates, but mothers had significantly lower rates of current enrollment in post-secondary programs at age 21. And that to me suggests that mothers are more likely to stop or maybe temporarily pause their schooling after they obtain a high school diploma or GED or after they obtain a vocational or associate's degree. Right? And that possibly could be because they need to enter workforce and they need to provide for their kids. Okay, um, so now let's take a little bit of a closer look only at moms, right? So we've looked at the entire sample up till now, comparing moms and not moms. Now we're only going to look at moms. Um, interestingly enough, there weren't a lot of differences by race ethnicity, right? So their educational, uh, attainment did not differ by race ethnicity at all. That lower bar, uh, lower blue bar at the other race category, take that with a grain of salt. Yes, it seems like uh, females of other races um, had lower rates of higher education enrollment or credential, but those numbers were really low. So I am not reading too much into that. And these differences in general are not significant. Um, so fairly similar by race ethnicity. What was different is if you look at mothers who left care before age 19 and those who remained in care, and you will see that there is about a 10% difference in higher education enrollment or credential, right? Less than 20% of moms who left care by age 19 uh, had uh, pursued higher education or had a credential. Uh, and that's um, as compared to about close to 30% of girls uh, who still were in care at age 19, okay? Um, a similar effect was present for homelessness, right? So girls who at age 19 reported that they've experienced homelessness uh, were less likely to report higher education enrollment or credential at age 21 they were also significantly more likely to not have a high school diploma at all, right? So you'll see over 30% of these girls who've experienced homelessness, um, they did not have a high school diploma, right? And clearly they were also less likely to enroll in higher education. Um, and then uh, moms who had employment experience uh, were more likely to enroll in higher education at age 21. So if they had employment experience at age 19, either full-time or part-time, they were more likely to enroll in higher education at age 21 or receive a higher education credential. Um, and all of these differences are statistically significant. Um, there was also a, a, an effect for having a supportive adult so moms who had a supportive adult at age 19 were more likely to, you will see in that blue uh, column, they were more likely to um, either be enrolled in higher education or receive a credential uh, by age 21 or both, right? Those who had a credential, I count them as credential, but they could also be enrolled. Um, so, so they have the higher rates if they had a supportive adult. And also again, you will see that effect for not having a high school diploma at all. Those moms who did not have a supportive adult were much more likely uh, to not have a high school diploma, over 30% rate there. 
Um, and then the last one here is educational financial aid, and you'll see very large differences there, but you also should remember that there is a little bit of the chicken and the egg there. Obviously, moms who received educational financial assistance at age 19, so over 40% of those moms were, um, enroll, were either enrolled uh, in higher education at age 21 or received a credential. Right, and that is as opposed to less than 20% of moms who did not receive educational financial assistance. But keep in mind that receiving educational financial assistance, the way that it's defined in NITED, likely implies that at age 19 they were already enrolled in higher education, right? And that's why they received this aid. So, again, I think educational financial assistance is important in its own accord, but these large differences are probably also because only those girls who were, or mostly the girls that were already enrolled in higher education, received that educational financial assistance that also includes student loans and things like that and the definition. Um, okay, so again, main takeaways from this, um, moms who left foster care by age 19 and those who experienced homelessness were less likely to report post-secondary enrollment or credential at age 21. And as opposed to that, moms with employment experience, those who had supportive adults, those who received educational financial aid, were more likely to report for secondary attainment at age 21. Um, and as I've said before, race ethnicity didn't really matter. Um, in multinomial logistic regression, uh, which again included only moms and looked at the timing of birth, uh, the key finding there was that girls who had children between ages 17 and 19 or and or between ages 19 and 21 were less likely to report higher education enrollment or credential at age 21. But if they gave birth before age 17, once you control for that subsequent birth, right, that didn't significantly impact higher education enrollment or credential at age 21. So timing matters, right? Um, and it makes sense. We could talk a little bit more about that in the practice implications. But essentially, when, parent, when these girls have to parent very young kids, clearly they struggle more in terms of uh, remaining in school, right? Uh, possibly because of childcare and probably because of other issues as well. Um, but I would love to also hear your thoughts on why you think this happens. In terms of risk and protective factors, so this arrow down means that they had a decreased likelihood of post-secondary educational attainment and the arrow up is increased. And again, those are all factors that we've discussed before. They remain significant in multivariate analysis as well. Uh, earlier exit from foster care actually trend, it was a strong trend. It was about 0.06 or something like that, but it was actually a trend once all other variables were controlled. Um, okay, so um, summary and implications, right? Um, I guess what, what, what's important to take away from this? I think one of the important things is, uh, again, I've said this before, childbirth is really common, right? So by not considering childbirth, when we talk about post-secondary attainment among girls in foster care, um, that's a problem. And even this 40%, it's probably an underestimate because remember, this sample includes girls who are more likely to be in care at age 19 than other girls in NITED. And those girls who stay in care longer are actually, based on many prior studies, less likely to have kids, right? So probably the ones that we couldn't include because they didn't participate in all NITED surveys, they probably have even higher rates of birth, right? So even in this underestimate it's 40%, right? And we really need to account for that when we think about higher education access. Mothers are disadvantaged, even compared to other foster youth, not to mention uh, if we compare them to non-foster youth, right? And childbirth during the period of transition to adulthood, that period of ages 17 to 21, that seems to be to have the biggest effect, at least at age 21. Again, it would have been great to follow up uh, more. Unfortunately, NITED doesn't have an age 23. Uh, I wish it did, uh, because I think we could learn a lot uh, by having another data point. 
Uh, but even in this, in, in what we do have, uh, we could sort of see how the timing of birth matters. Now, what can we do about it, right? And that, um, I, I like to call, so I guess from research that I've done in this population, um, there are certain factors that just kind of come again and again and again and relate to outcomes in meaningful ways. So um, I called it the four S's framework. I'm actually using this terminology in another webinar I'll be doing soon um, because this really seems to be a recurrent theme in this population of expectant and parenting foster youth. So what does that mean? Um, essentially to help youth um, or expectant and parenting youth, right? Parenting youth in this particular instance do better. I think there are these four factors that really make a difference. And that is school, stability, support, and stay in care, hence the four S's, right? Um, and, and I think this really relates to this specific situation as well, right? So in terms of school, it's really important to connect foster youth uh, with educational settings. We know from research on this population and also the general youth population that if youth are in school and they have positive educational vocational trajectories, they're more likely to delay birth, right? Um, and if they have a child already, they might be more likely to delay subsequent births. So it's really, really important to keep these girls in school early on, because obviously if they drop out of school at the high school level, there, it's gonna be that much more difficult for them to later pursue higher education. And there was some really good recent research on how pursuing higher education translates to really tangible benefits in terms of earnings later on uh, for foster youth, right? So we really need to keep them in school early, right? To prevent dropout, to prevent disruption, in order for these girls to later pursue higher education, right? And potentially also avoid subsequent births or new births. Um, the other kind of, the other S is stability. And when I talk about stability, I think it's important to talk about stability in school and also stability in placements, right? So stability in school matters. We know that foster youth are likely to experience school transitions, right? And school transitions translate to problematic achievement later on, right? And, and being behind. So it's really important to, uh, to make sure that these youth uh, are not disrupted and, and, and they stay in stable school settings. And by the way, girls who become pregnant might potentially be more likely to experience this school instability. And clearly placement stability is important for a whole host of outcomes for foster youth. Um, I didn't talk a lot about uh, placement stability here because it didn't differentiate much between, it, it wasn't necessarily predictive of higher education um, attainment, but it did differentiate between those youth who didn't have a high school diploma or GED and those that did, right? So by extension, that also translates to higher education at some point. Uh, so keeping youth in stable placements um, is really, really important. Um, in terms of support, they need instrumental support. They need emotional support. Uh, to negotiate new motherhood, they need a lot of support, especially if they also want to pursue higher education, right? So. Uh, I think it's really important to have access to caring adults, right, that are willing to talk to them about higher education options, to help them fill out FAFSA application, uh, to help them with childcare if they are in school, right, and if they don't have that kind of support, uh, then it's really difficult for them to manage higher education, especially when their kids are very young and need a lot, right, um, and then staying in care, uh, again, all research essentially on foster youth talks about the benefits of staying in care. For this particular population, it's really important staying in care longer uh, delays childbirth, right? Less youth who stay in care are less likely to give birth, and they're also more likely to be educationally successful. So it's really important to keep these girls in care for as long as the state legislation allows. Uh, in, 
and in those states that still don't extend foster care, it's really important to advocate for that extension because it really matters. Um, I wanted to quickly touch on COVID-19. I think that expectant and parenting foster youth are particularly disadvantaged by the pandemic. They are affected not only by the disruption of services to themselves, but also by childcare difficulties and school closures, by disruption of employment and education. Uh, they might have a higher likelihood of uh, COVID-19 related morbidity and caregiving responsibilities, right? Remember that most girls who are parenting are racial uh, or not most, but a lot of girls who are parenting are racial and ethnic minorities. And those have also been more affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, right? So there is a kind of confluence of difficult circumstances for these girls. And I think that you could use that 4S framework to modify that to uh, really support these girls during the pandemic. For instance, I know in some states they've extended or they put kind of like a moratorium on aging out of care. They've extended that eligibility to stay in care for a few more months. And that could be really important, right? So efforts like that, uh, what kinds of supports can we provide during the pandemic, right? How can we make sure they're stable? How can we make sure that they are not disrupted in their schooling? And how can we keep them in care? Because during the pandemic, that's particularly important, right? All of that uh, could make a difference for these girls. And last but not least, I want to pitch a, a little primer about dads. So this, was, this uh, project was primarily about moms for a variety of reasons, but I just want to kind of put it out there that there is virtually no research about fathers in foster care in general, and certainly nothing I've seen about their post-secondary educational attainment. Um, and fatherhood is not uncommon among this population. About 70 per, 17, I'm sorry, percent of males in knighted uh, reported fathering a child by age 21, right? And I've looked very generally, um, uh, kind of trying to see what are their uh, higher ed status. I didn't do any multivariate analysis or nothing complicated, but I just wanted to very quickly see what's the snapshot of this. Um, and as you can see, um, males who have kids are actually even more underrepresented in higher education than females, which again is not surprising in some ways because we know girls um, have higher educational attainment in general for this population than boys. But still, you know, less than 10% of boys who have children are enrolled in higher education, right? As compared to about 20% of those who do not have kids. And here you could see too, about 11% of fathers are either enrolled or have a credential as compared to more than 25% of boys who are not fathers. So quite substantial discrepancies there. And I think more research um, is certainly needed and the same effect for extended foster care uh, that exists for um, girls also exists for boys here. Um, so overall, young fathers are significantly underrepresented in higher education settings uh, compared to males that don't have kids. And this is especially true for fathers that leave care by age 19, of whom only 8% are either enrolled in higher education or have a credential, just 8%. That's really, really low. Um, so we really need additional research about dads. Yeah, I think that's it. The last thing I want to mention is limitations. As I've said before, NITED is great because it provides a large sample uh, on a population where other large samples are just not available. It's very hard to do research on, for instance, young fathers, because in most other data sets, there are just not enough of them. Um, but NITED also has some important limitations and primarily response rates vary quite significantly by states and that might create bias, right? And as I've said before, youth who are included in this sample uh, were more likely to be in extended foster care at age 19, which probably impacted the rates of childbirth and fatherhood. It underestimates those rates. 
uh, because those youth who exited care are likely to have even higher rates. The other issues is, uh, is that NITED is really not very detailed in the variables. It's all yes, no variables. So we, we can't really, we don't know how many kids, for instance, this youth had, right? Some youth might, had, might have had two children between ages 19 and 21, and others might have one. And does that matter? Maybe it does, but we don't know how, right? And obviously, um, even though uh, this analysis, especially the the multi uh, the longitudinal, I'm sorry, the multivariate analysis were longitudinal in their nature, we can't make any causal inferences uh, from these uh, analysis, right? So I'm not saying that having a supportive adult causally relates to higher education. Um, but the, these are associations um, and they repeat um, across various samples. So my stance is if something repeats over and over again, there is more confidence in that. And those findings um, I've seen across several databases. Um, so I have some confidence in that, but no causal inferences, obviously. Um, that's it. I guess if there are questions, I'm happy to, I'm happy to talk about it. Great. Thanks so much, Svetlana. Um, so I'll give people, uh, please go ahead and type in your questions into the chat box um, and I will uh, read those out to Svetlana for her to answer them. Um, okay, so let me just read through. Um, what is, uh, let's see, this one is a little bit tricky for me to read out. So um, this one has to do with um, TAMP or, and cash assistance and mm -hmm. potentially having higher education count as workforce training hours, which I'm not familiar with this, so I don't know how to phrase that. Um, but what are your thoughts about, about that? I'm sorry, can you say that again? So cash assistance is? Uh, TAMP or cash assistance and having, um, the potential, I think the question is, what is the potential of having higher education count as workforce training hours for young parents? You know, um, I am not sure. I would have to look into that. Um, what I can say is in, in sort of the larger analysis, um, I was wondering, so NITA does have a, a variable related to cash assistance. Um, and I was um, wondering, um, I was thinking about including that and seeing if moms who receive um, cash assistance and other supports like housing support and, and things like that, um, are they more likely to enroll in higher education? Um, I didn't include it here, um, but, um, but I think that that's, that's interesting to look at. One of the reasons I didn't include it is those questions about cash assistance are only asked of those girls who aged out of care already. If they're still in care, they're not asked. And that cuts the sample by much. Uh, so, so I didn't, uh, I didn't include it. I'm not sure about what it, in terms of if it qualifies or not. I, I bet that varies by state. But if somebody else knows the answer to that, um, please type that and I'm happy to, to talk about it more. And I'm happy to look at that as well. Um, oh, sorry. Does somebody else just say something? No, I'm, I'm seeing some questions in my chat as well. Yeah, I was going to just read this out. Yeah. So the next question is, um, did the Multnomah, uh, Mult, Mul <laughs> I can't say it today. Multnomah uh, logistic regression. Yes, logistic <laughs> regression, sorry, everyone. Um, analysis include just mothers or all females, including those who never had a child? So I actually ran it both ways. Uh, here I included just moms, right? But I also ran it with all females. And actually the findings didn't really differ much. Um, so I'm still debating what I'll do for the, for the actual article, um, but I did run it both ways and the findings were quite similar. I would say that for all females, the, the biggest effect uh, for birth was for those who given birth between ages 19 and 21, whereas for just moms, ages 17 to 19 were also more significant, right? But the trends and the directions were all the same. Uh, regardless of how you run it. Thanks. Um, so the next question is, are you planning a qualitative study to explore this topic? 
So um, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm planning something. <laughs> um, I don't know if, if, if I'm going to do a strict qualitative study, but certainly a mixed methods study. I would love to do some primary data collection on this topic uh, or look at other data that potentially has information on birth but just didn't break down by uh, higher education attainment by childbirth, right? So I, I definitely want to look at this further. I think that um, what exactly that would be remains to be determined at this point. Once I'm done with the other two primary data collection projects I have, um, I'm certainly going to look at that. I really do think that more research is needed on this population. Um, we can't ignore it, right? So many girls have kids and they have kids exactly at the time where they're supposed to um, uh, also enroll in higher education. So if we're not um, if we're not counting them, if we're not looking at their experiences, then we're missing out on some information and how to support them. Thank you. Okay, so the, I'm going to put two questions together because they, they're a little bit related. So one question is, what advice would you give for how to support um, pregnant and parenting youth in higher education settings or in campus support programs? And then um, I know at the beginning, a lot of people identify that issue around child care. So are you aware of examples of campuses who have um, found good solutions to the child care piece? So that's an excellent question. Um, I've, I've actually um, thought about that in connection with the campus support program that we have on our campus. And I wasn't able to find, I think to the first part, right? Um, I think child childcare has to be part of the equation, right? Um, and from what research tells us about these girls, it's not as straightforward as providing some kind of care, right? A lot of these young moms are very worried about increased surveillance and losing their kids to child protective services. And they are uh, monitored more closely than other moms, right? So some of these moms are very much uh, picky about where they're gonna put their kids. Um, so I think that the best way would be to provide childcare as part of this campus support programs, right? Because these would be universities that they're or colleges that they're familiar with, uh, potentially a setting where they could drop in and visit their kids when they're, while they're in school, right? And, and see that everything is okay. Um, so I absolutely think childcare is, is, is an important part, especially during the pandemic. Uh, think about these moms that now are supposed to navigate remote schooling for their kids. And a lot of their kids have needs, right? Educational needs. So it's really, um, it's really, really important um, to, to introduce childcare uh, into the support programs. Now, I am not familiar um, with a campus support program that offers childcare, but that's not to say that they don't exist. I'm only now starting this project and I will be looking at that very, very closely. Uh, so if somebody is familiar with that, um, that would be that would be great. I would love to know that. I am we don't offer that on our campus. Yeah, I haven't seen anyone else uh, type in anything. So I think that might be the end of our questions. Um, so thank you so much, Svetlana. We really appreciate you being here today. Um, thanks for sharing your really interesting research. Um, so thank everyone. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. Um, and again, uh, just a reminder that we will be posting both the slides as well as the recording of today's webinar on the NRC FAHE website. Thanks everyone. Thank you everybody.